Good evening, everyone. My name is Holly Crawford, and this semester it has been my privilege to work with the Oklahoma Funding Accelerator as their team lead, or as they sometimes like to call me, their team mom. <laughs> it's been an incredible semester, and I would like to just give a few shout outs to the people who really made this semester possible. Starting with my interns, uh, Matt, Clayton, Daniel, and Sam. They've put in a lot of hard work this semester, from late night meetings to early morning meetings. Uh, powered by a lot more caffeine than I often wanted to know about. I was a little worried about them at points, but they, they've all made it here this evening. Um, and it, it's been incredible to watch their, uh, their endurance over the course of the semester, and I think that that is truly a testament to uh, the fact that they're, they know that they're furthering the ICC of mission of increasing the economic health, <laughs> excuse me, economic wealth right here in the state of Oklahoma, as you'll see over the course of their presentation. Um, unfortunately, I was not able over the course of the semester to convince them to start eating more kale. But nevertheless, uh, I'm incredibly proud of the accomplishments that they have made, and I hope that they are proud of their work as well. I would also like to take this time to thank our incredible clients, uh, the folks at Senderide, at Bot Books, at Legacy, and at Last Night's Game, all of the companies you'll learn about this evening. Uh, it's been an honor to work alongside you, and though I speak uh, on behalf of the guys when I say that as well, and we look forward to supporting you in the years to come. Finally, I would like to thank the ICCW staff, and especially Cassandra Rixby, our OFA fellow this semester, for all of the support that they've given us. It's been an incredible semester, it's been an honor to be back at CCW, and without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to the Spring 2017 Oklahoma Funding Accelerator. This semester, the Oklahoma Funding Accelerator's Accelerator team has had the opportunity to work with four unique early stage companies to help solve some of the most pressing challenges that they currently face. So through extensive research, along with our unique perspective, we think we've created some real, impactful recommendations that we can pass off to help them going forward. I'd like to start by introducing the OFA team. My name is Matthew Mullins. I'm a finance and economics junior from Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm working with Legacy. My name is Clayton Bradshaw. I'm an international business and MIS senior from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been working with last night's game. I'm Sam Bogson. I'm a finance and econ junior from Colorado Springs, and I've been working with Bob Notebooks. My name is Daniel O'Connell. I'm a petroleum engineering senior, also working on my MBA from Long Beach, California, and I've been working with Sendra. Legacy is a Norman-based startup founded by three local police officers. Legacy's mission is to help support the local honor guard, which performs various police ceremonies throughout the year, as well as attending police funerals. Traditionally, the Honor Guard expenses, especially travel, are paid for out of pocket, and so Legacy's mission is to help support the Honor Guard by selling apparel and accessory items and donating the proceeds back to the Honor Guard. So, Legacy has the opportunity to create real impact for the community, and in order to do that, we set out this semester to increase sales. Breaking that down into three objectives, I learned that in order to do this, Legacy needed to, one, be able to market its mission to consumers, it needed to develop an optimal product mix that a small company could use, and then it needed to be able to advertise those products to our target market. And so looking at the optimal product mix, and in order to get to that, I had first conducted an extensive survey with over 40 or 50 respondents. In addition to that, I spoke with three of Legacy's closest competitors and was able to narrow down the optimal product mix to three different lines. An apparel line of dry fits and t-shirts, a drink or a line of shot glasses and pint glasses, and an accessory line of wristbands and challenge points. Once we selected the optimal product mix, the next thing I set out to do was to see if our objective of US manufacturing was possible. So we carefully selected four or five manufacturers for each product, and then after selecting the main one for each one, we were able to narrow it down and find that U.S. manufacturing was indeed viable, and in fact, we can increase their profit margins by approximately 9.3% per product. And then looking at previous sales that Legacy had conducted with different demo products, I was able to project one year's sales into the future for them. And looking at this had some exciting results for us. We saw that after two months of sales, Legacy would be able to fully fund its first Honor Guard trip. By about the halfway point of sales, Legacy would be able to recover the sunk costs that the three founders had originally put into the company. And by the end of the first year, not only would Legacy be able to fund the average of 16 Honor Guard trips they were um, experiencing every year, but they'd also have enough proceeds left over to fund five additional Honor Guard, Honor Guard trips. 
And so going forward, a few key deliverables I'll be handing off to them will be a detailed advertising strategy, along with my recommendations for manufacturers, and a list of events that they should look to attend going forward. And so the next steps for Legacy are going to be to reach out to local journalists and newspapers to help spread their, spread their mission to the community, as well as attend the Oklahoma Chiefs Police Conference in June, and then continue growing their Facebook subscribers by about an average of 200 per month. And now I'm going to pass off to Clayton, who's going to tell you about last night's game. Thank you, Matt. Sports are everywhere. In fact, more people filled out a fantasy sports bracket in 2016 than voted in the U.S. presidential election. It's clear that sports are a huge part of our culture, but what are you supposed to do if you're not necessarily a sports fan and you still want to be able to join the conversation? That's where last night's game comes in. Last night's game is a three-time a week newsletter for the sports curious, those who don't necessarily identify as sports fans, but still want to be able to engage in the conversation. They send out a three-time a week newsletter with simple curated sports news to allow you to join the conversation, whether that's at work, with your friends, or anywhere else in your life. Last night's game, their, most big, their biggest challenge has been focusing on how to grow the subscriber base. They have great user feedback, and they have a fantastic product, but to date, they only have a few hundred subscribers. So this semester, my focus has been on growing that subscriber base, developing the overall brand, and understanding when and how they should begin to monetize. Focusing on that, I've been able to develop three core strategies that will allow them to add over 10,000 new subscribers in their first year of implementation. In order to come to these strategies, I've conducted a number of interviews with both existing subscribers to understand what they love about last night's game, as well as how they found it, in addition to their target audience and other companies who are in the space. Last night's game is not alone, and there have been a couple of companies who have been quite successful in this same niche. And so I wanted to understand what they had done to see their own success and how last night's game could borrow from that. I was able to develop three core strategies that last night's game should focus on in order to achieve this over 10,000 subscribers, including doing contests and giveaways, as well as cross-promotion and guest posts. One of the most promising for low cost and easy implementation is cross-promotion due to the fact that they can hone in on a target audience and a very specific niche group and that way they are able to not only attract an audience that makes similar uh, ideas and attractions to their own content, but they're also able to do it in a very low cost, beneficial way for both parties. Taking those subscriber projections into account, I wanted to look at the monetization to understand how last night's game could start generating revenue and turn this into a long-term sustainable business. Now, based on my subscriber calculations and three main ways of monetization, they're going to be able to generate over $60,000 in their first year of monetization. I'm recommending that they do not monetize based on affiliate marketing and native advertising, two primary forms for common newsletter subscriptions, until they hit at least 5,000 subscribers, which will be roughly the six month mark. However, an opportunity that they have in the next few weeks includes apparel sales. One of the demands from their audience has been apparel sales, both in t-shirts, mugs, and other merchandise. And it's very promising both from a price point as well as a demand standpoint speaking to existing users. So they'll be selling this starting in the next few weeks, which allows them to start generating revenue immediately as well as focusing on the months ahead. Going forward, I'll be providing last night's game with some key tools in order to ensure that these strategies are success moving forward. First of all, a marketing guide implementing the strategies that I've recommended, as well as an interactive guide and projections for both their subscriber and their monetization growth based on key metrics such as their click-through rates, opens, and other things that are critical to an email newsletter. And finally, recommending over 100 new partnerships that they should seek out and pursue their strategic based on their current audience demographic as well as new opportunities in the market. Going forward, last night's game should focus on developing unique content for these partnerships, as well as starting to develop these partnerships and focusing on monetization in order to become a long-term sustainable company. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Sam, who's gonna tell you about Mod Notebooks. Thank you. So Mod Notebooks is an Oklahoma City-based startup run by two brothers, Will and Charles Bowersock. Will and Charles Bowersocks were both graduates from the OE Price College of Business. And after having met with them, I can tell you, they're not just acquainted with notebooks, they're real notebook lovers. And what they want to do is create a product that not only are you going to be proud to write it and want to put all your best memories and ideas in, 
but you'll be able to send it in, have it scanned and digitized so you can view all of your favorite ideas long after the words have faded off the page. So, when I was working with this company, I, one of my big questions was, how can we make them expand, grow, and have a broader reach in the United States? And I started breaking that question down into a few smaller key questions. So, how can we improve their manufacturing and revamp their products to make it even better than it is right now? Along with, um, how can we market their notebook and then get more people to see it? And finally, should they expand into any secondary markets or start providing any other products? And my first recommendation, I'm going to say they should stay in East Asia to avoid a 122% markup by moving to the United States. And I'm going to talk about the next two points in my next few slides. So, looking at, looking at the secondary markets, I found that Mod should actually stick to their primary business of selling notebooks due to the fact that it would avoid brand dilution by getting into unrelated businesses and because it's simply the most profitable and the other businesses were not viable. So I started off by dividing the secondary businesses into a few segments. So large businesses. They already have established scanning services. When I did some research on the Oklahoma City area, they already have over 10 large scale scanning services just within the metro area. And then looking at small businesses, niche businesses such as co-working spaces, the architecture college, because they produce a large volume of documents. So when I spoke to them, I spoke to members of four different co-working spaces in the Oklahoma City Metro, three architecture professors at the OU College of Architecture, and found that while they are interested in our service, services uh, for scanning their documents, it's just not viable, it wouldn't scale up, and it's not something that Will and Charles should spend so much time on. And then finally, scanning non-mod numbers. I surveyed people, I surveyed about 40 people through Google surveys and through Woody Qualtrics and asked Will and Charles to survey people that had purchased mod notebooks and found at the price people are willing to pay, mod, mod notebooks would incur a $3.81 loss per non-mod notebook scanned. So they simply shouldn't enter into it. So at this moment, mod notebooks has done no outbound advertising. That is to say, they don't do anything on Facebook, Google, no banner ads. Everything's been through word of mouth because everyone loves their notebooks. But I think that they need to pick up their marketing in order to start selling. And so through some research, I figured that online they should focus on Facebook advertising as opposed to, say, Google AdWords, Twitter, Instagram. And that for direct marketing, they should focus on trade shows, especially the national stationery show coming up in May. So the reason I picked Facebook advertising is because it's simply the most modular. You can alter it, make it a more visual ad, and it's very scalable and actually offers a great return. By only spending $5 a day on Facebook advertisements, they could earn a 180% ROI and reach over 3,000 people per day. Now, for trade shows, this is more of a long-term goal, but when people buy notebooks, they're looking for the feel of the notebook. They want to see what the paper's like, what the cover's like. And so by attending the National Stationery Show, they can reach over 10,000 trade professionals, 300 members of the press, and reach buyers from 48 different states and 55 countries. With the average buyer spending $78,000 at the National Stationery Show, this would be equivalent to mod selling 3,000 notebooks if they reached one buyer. So, moving forward, Mod Notebook should immediately start investing in Facebook advertising. And then they should transition to a new manufacturer within the next few months. And then once they've done that, they'll be, able, they'll be ready to present at the 2018 National Station Show. So, of the deliverables that I'm going to hand off to Will and Charles, are going to be a portfolio of 25 manufacturing partners in East Asia that I've screened, a short-term and long-term marketing plan, and an analysis of the returns they could get by pursuing these different ventures. So I'm going to hand it off to Daniel, who's going to talk to you about some of them. Thank you, Sam. Put yourself in the shoes of a chronic kidney disease patient. You have to travel to dialysis treatments three times per week, and you can't drive to or from your appointments because of the dizziness, nausea, and fatigue you feel after each appointment. You've exhausted your friends and family as resources for rides, and the other options are expensive and untimely. This is where Sam comes into play. 
CenterRide is a cloud-based ride-sharing platform that specializes in offering a safer and more secure ride-sharing service within Oklahoma City. Founded by Laura Fleet and her team of executives last year, CenterRide currently contracts with around 50 drivers for the, state, for the case of this presentation, I will be discussing the non-emergency medical transport portion of their business model. So over the course of my work with Senderide this semester, I was able to develop a detailed financial model that suggests that the most worthwhile services within non-emergency medical transport lie within hospital discharge patients, dialysis centers, as well as some key freestanding outpatient surgical centers. The model also suggests that Dallas-Fort Worth is the most attractive market on expansion outside of Oklahoma City. And with that, I was able to develop some key uh, operational requirements to succeed within these new markets. So through conversations with managers, case managers, and employees with several of the largest hospitals, as well as healthcare centers within the Oklahoma City area, I was able to develop key value propositions for each of the largest market segments, as well as determine some assumptions that helped me to value the net potential earnings for the entire Midwest at about $8 million a year for center. So looking specifically at hospital discharge patients, the value here derives, is derived from the move towards value-based medicine. What this implies is that hospitals are actually willing to pay for center ride for their patients in order to achieve cheaper care and more effective care to ultimately reduce the hospital readmission rate and increase the payments for Medicare and Medicaid. Looking at dialysis patients, the benefit here is that you're going to see a more uh, consistent set of transportation for the patients at a lower price point and a uh, higher rate of timeliness. For freestanding outpatient surgical centers, you're going to see benefits in the ease of planning for your procedures and that you're going to have not only this cheap service, but you're also going to be able to pre-schedule your appointments for pickup and drop-off, and you'll no longer have to have a friend or family member there with you during your appointment. So taking all this data and applying it to the major mid uh, metropolitan areas within the Midwest, I was able to determine that Dallas-Fort Worth was the most attractive market outside of Oklahoma City with a net potential earnings of about $1.6 million per year. While it doesn't have the highest net potential earnings, within the Midwest, there are a couple of key factors that make it attractive. One is that its uh, relative geographic location in relation to Oklahoma City is close enough to where management of expansion would be much easier. The next is that it has the highest number of large multi-campus hospitals. In fact, it has two of the largest multi-campus hospitals in the nation, one of which I was able to talk with the Transportation Department at to determine the applications of something like Cinderella. It also has the highest number of freestanding outpatient surgical centers, which can provide additional revenue and opportunity for Senderide. So moving forward, I suggest that Senderide currently work to expand all their opportunity within Oklahoma City, and then reassess their operational requirements to make sure that they're accurately meeting the demand for Senderide services. Then take this and apply it to another city, which I am recommending as Dallas-Fort Worth, for its exponentially large opportunity. To assist in this process, I'll be handing over my detailed financial model, as well as a prioritized list of targets across each city to help with this expansion process and to give them some direction. I will also be providing some suggested operational requirements that have calculated <coughs> some assumptions to accurately meet the demand for Centro. So with this, in behalf, and on behalf of the Oklahoma Funding Accelerator, we would like to thank our team lead, Holly Crawford, as well as our mentors and specific clients We'd also like to thank you guys for coming out tonight. At this point, we'd like to open the floor for questions. Uh, 
Uh, Uber simply doesn't have the uh, licensing or the liability investment to kind of do a, uh, uh, offer a service like this. And so one of the centerized main differentiators is that they have a patented, uh, they have a patent on their uh, technology that allows you to pick drivers that have experience with your issue that you're facing. So if you are a dialysis patient, you can pick a driver that has experience with uh, dialysis patients. And uh, the other portion of Center Ride's uh, business model, that actually Center Ride started out as a sitter, so it was aimed at um, giving rides to children as well as elderly. Uh, with Uber, you're not allowed to service people under 18, and so we have the licensing and the uh, healthcare requirements for those services. Thank you.